Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, please. Chapter six. The book of Hebrews. Is. In my opinion. The book that never quits. And it goes in levels. And we're going to deal with the beginning of the first level. Now in this, in the very beginning of this ministry, the Lord showed us our mission statement. So we'll look first in the fifth chapter and we'll read down uh, and get ready for the therefore in chapter six. And so well, you, you just gnarly keep them reading all that. Verse five. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he said unto them, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that them that obey him called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered since you're dull of hearing. But now he, he's about to go into that later. And that's where you, you, you really get into the meat of this book. For the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Are you, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a baby. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even though who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Right there is our mission statement. To bring people from milk to meat and to become skillful in the word of righteousness and grow up and be mature. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection or maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit. So the principle of the fundamental doctrines of Christ. That makes these things sacred you can take each one of these and spend sessions on it. Repentance from dead works. Second Timothy chapter two. And we'll just touch on some of these and, and go on because we're, we're dealing with the laying on of hands. Second Timothy
Now you come down here and you find out to whom we are speaking and you could, you, well, you need to read the whole second chapter. And uh, you come down here, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My, you could spend time on that and should. Shun profane and vain babblings and they'll increase more to ungodliness and, and all of these things. Verse 22, flee also youthful lust, follow righteousness, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing they do gender strive. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If good peradventure they give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, Having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Rather than to go through all of these. That is repentance from dead works. Dead works. Jesus said, your traditions make the word of God of no effect. That's dead works. Traditions. Well, this is the way we do it. We've always done it this way. And that young whippersnapper's not going to come down here from Fort Worth and tell us how to do it. I face that. They can't call me a young whipper. I guess I'm an old whippersnapper now. <laughs> Those are dead works. Preaching a lot of things and preach same thing over, 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 over. You preach salvation to people that are saved. And the problem you get into when you do that, they, be they begin to feel like they're not. And then when you begin to preach that and you preach sin all the time, they're gonna, you're going to have a congregation full of sinning people. Bunch of born again people. You remember what the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus? Just quit lying. Let him that stole steal no more. <laughs> Let him work with his hand that which is good in order to have to give. Dead works. All right. Faith towards God. Mark eleven twenty two. <laughs> Glory to God. We don't even have to turn there. Because that, that's our mandate is to teach people faith and bring them from milk to meat. The doctrine of baptisms. Now you can take these um, scriptures. We won't turn to them right now. Romans 6, 3 and Galatians 3, 27. Well, we look at Romans 6, 3. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. That's baptism. Well, then we know there's baptism in water and we know there's baptism in the spirit. So that's three of them right there. And we need to practice all three. And at EMIC, the tank's full all the time. Praise God. You don't ever have to warm it up. It's, it's there. It's ready. The laying on of hands right in the middle of all this, then resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Now, there's, there's several this is not the time to go into all that. There are two right now that are very important to the believer at this time. 
So we will take a look at that. Matthew 7. <laughs> judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. What measure you measure shall be measured unto you again. Why beholdest thou the mote that's in your brother's eye and consider not the beam that's in your own eye? What's that talking about? That when you see things around the culture in which you were raised, your ideas, and we're raised differently. I'm a country boy from Texas. Well, as an example, let's just take a trip to New York City. Here's a white guy walking down the street. What time is it? Oh, it's uh, rest just straight up nine o'clock, a couple seconds later. Thank you. It's a black guy. What time is it? What am I? Big Ben? I dare say, had a black man ask him, he would have told him. Amen. You walk, there's an Indian guy walking on it. What time is it? Hmm. Here comes a Puerto Rican guy. What time is it? You want to buy a wash? <laughs> I don't... I, Maybe that says the whole thing. <clears throat> Each one, you don't have any idea what's in that person's life. And they may do or say something to you that just really burns you, but you have no idea what happened to that person at home this morning. So take care of what's in your own eye before you set out to correct somebody else and judge them. <clears throat> the other one, of course, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when the Apostle Paul, and we won't, we won't turn there, I, I can quote it to you. He said, and I, and I, I paraphrase it, before you enter into communion, judge yourself. Don't take it unworthily. Judge yourself that you be not judged with the world. For because of this, many are asleep and sickly. Why, Brother Copeland? Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And you go into communion and all the way to church. You've been running down the pastor and both of you just sitting there said, well, I'll tell you one thing. If I was him, I wouldn't have done that. Well, if you was him, that's exactly what you'd have done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know how I love pastor. Here it comes. <laughs> Judgment. It's so easy to do. Most people call it criticism. It isn't. It's judging. And from what Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. You criticize somebody and you judge them and you start talking about them, particularly right there in the congregation or right there in the workplace. I can give you full assurance based on what Jesus said, it's coming. You're going to get the same opportunity to pass the same test and I doubt if you make it. Besides that, unless you're part of the church, you don't know why the pastor did what he did or said what he said. So if you don't, go ask him. I'll bellyache about it to somebody else. <laughs> that's not my message tonight. That's free of charge. <laughs> but those, 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 that's judgment. And if you just keep on and keep on doing that, keep on, judgment's coming. Yes. Judgment is the mercy of God. 
rather than just leave you alone until he just push you and push you and push you and push you until it kills you or something. You come to your senses and you're laying there in the bed wondering what's wrong and you just said, say like I did there in Shreveport and I just said, Lord, you can't miss it. I did. I've missed this someplace. There's been more than once, lots of times, I just go before the Lord and I say, Lord, here I am. Judge me. Now I've messed up someplace because everything around me is messed up. You judge me so I can judge myself. Whatever it is, let's burn it up now instead of waiting till eternal judgment. So now, the laying on of hand, of course, resurrection from the dead and uh, we, there, there's not enough preaching on that. Go through, the, go through in the different resurrections and how they happened and, and why. The study of, of, of Lazarus is <laughs> amazing. But there were people resurrected during the six weeks that Jesus was ministering in the earth after he was raised from the dead before he left. Don't discount that six weeks. You hear me? Now he's the pattern. I'm, I don't, I don't go with my opinions much, but I'm, I'm strong on this since he's the pattern. I firmly believe that we're going to have six weeks. And it may not be everybody. I don't know that. But there are some people and some mamas that have prayed for, like my mother prayed for me <laughs> night and day, that it just might be that mama comes to that wayward boy and she says, now boy, mama, what you doing here? You just say, sit down there and listen to me. Now you better get your act straight. Gone. That could happen and you not know it. What do you mean? Well, I'll tell you. My dad, his knees were bone on bone. He was in such terrible pain. So he was, they did surgery on both of them. And I found out later, I was in Hawaii. I, we, Gloria and I were preaching there. And, um, and I, I found out that he, he had some real problems and they were, they were really afraid he was going to die. He, he began to bleed in the hospital. And I, and I got home. He said, he said, Kenneth, uh, you came to see me in my room. I said, Dad, tell me about it. Well, he was kind of surprised that I didn't know. He said, yeah, you came in the room and you looked at me and you said, you said, Daddy, everything's going to be all right. And he said, I said, well, I know it will. And he said, I just went on back to sleep. And he said, next morning, he said, I didn't have any more pain. He said, I was all right. So you see, these things could be happening in that time there, in that time frame. So now, the laying on of hands. Hallelujah. So Lord, all right. Mark 16. You know that one had to be in there. So many people have received healing through this. Mark 16. He upbraided them because they didn't believe the people that told him he had had risen. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. He, a creature, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not will be condemned. These signs, these signatures will follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it'll not harm them. These are all signs. And here's another sign. They shall lay hands on the sick and the, they shall recover. 
That's an exceeding great and precious promise. Well, Mark 8, 24. I know I'm going backwards. That's just a funny way of writing things. Eight twenty-four. In the twenty-second verse, he came to Bethsaida. Bethsaida, they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. Well, now you can see right there, Jesus had to be famous for his touch. That's what they came to him. Touch him. That's all he needs. <laughs> Just touch him. He'll be all right. So, <laughs> praise God. So he put his hands, he led him out of town. Why did he do that? Too much unbelief. He got him out of town. They came to him. He agreed, but we're going out here. So he laid his hands on him and he asked him what he, if he, he asked him if he saw anything. He looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Well, Brother Copeland, why did he do all that in order to get him where he could see? Yes. Why? Why? Well, I don't know. Ask him. <laughs> There's a lot, in, a lot involved in it. And Jesus just didn't do it all just the same way every time. It was in uh, Southwest. When was that, George? Let's see. It wasn't last year, a year before. Three years, maybe? Yeah. I walked down uh, during healing school that Saturday morning. And the, the Lord, I, I just stepped down off the platform and walked down and I was led to this woman. She was in a wheelchair and her, I found out later as her granddaughter, I didn't know at the time. And she had dark glasses on. And so I walked up there in front of her and uh, I just took her glasses off and I, I said, may I do what Jesus did? She said, by all means. So I went like this and put my hand over her eyes. And I didn't take them off until I had a victory release in my spirit. Several seconds there. I took them off and I said, what do you see? She said, I see you. Well, I didn't know anything about it. She showed up at EMIC the next morning and pastor interviewed her. I mean, it was her granddaughter and I mean, she just came right across that platform and, and, and uh, <laughs> George said, what, what are you, what's the matter with you? She said, I had double vision so bad that I was legally blind. And she said, when Brother, Brother Copeland took his hands on me, she said, everything was, and she said, I can see him clearly. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't do that every time. I've done it a few times only, but that's what the spirit of God put in my heart to do that day. And uh, <laughs> George said, how old are you? She said, I'm 78, going straight. <laughs> and she pastored church. 
So now she can go back and start pastoring the church again. Now, <clears throat> Mark 6, 5, we, 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 we talked about this, but let's look at it again. This, this is something good here. <clears throat> this is where he was in hometown there. It's more detailed in Luke's gospel, but this was Mark's account of it. And uh, <clears throat> he began to teach in the synagogue. Many, many hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought th by his hands? Is, this <clears throat> is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. May I, may I remind you of something? Every prophet is kin to somebody. There's only one that came here and wasn't kin to anybody, and that's Adam. Everybody since is kin to somebody. <laughs> A person in my own family, bless his heart, I can just see his thing. <laughs> he said, do you think Kenneth is a prophet? And the person says, yeah, I think he is. He's, why, he's our kin folks. <laughs> well, see, hometown. Hometown. Anyway, but here's what I want you to see. And there, now he marveled because of their unbelief. There he could do no mighty work save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. I mean, they wouldn't hear a thing in the world. They wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't pay any attention to what he preached, but he laid hands on a few of them anyway. And some of them got it. And he went about teaching in all of their villages. So I believe there were many more of them as time went because they didn't know he was doing mighty works. So praise God. Mark 5 was, was J. Irish. We read this this morning. He besought him greatly. Now, he's at the seashore there. He's about the, the, the Sea of Galilee. They, they, just put, they just pushed the boat up there and, and his whole staff got out. He was already waiting and obviously he was up front. And he just fell right there in the edge of that water and besought him greatly. My little daughter just pointed to death. You come lay your hands on her, she'll live. So I present to you <laughs> that Jesus did a lot of touching people. Yes. Yes. And there's, there are scriptures that say everybody touched him were healed. Now he didn't heal everybody. He healed all of them that would let him. There were some that he had to appear to, including his own family, his brothers that thought he was crazy. There's one place that said he's lunatic. In other words, he's moonstruck. <laughs> Why would they think that? Because he won't promote himself. He won't do what a prophet's supposed to do. And then nobody knows anything about it. And he just goes around doing all this. It was really envy because there's 40, 50,000 people following him around all the time and he wouldn't play games with them. Uh, your mother and your brothers are out front. They'd like to speak to you. He said, who are my mother and brother but the ones that do the will of my father? He wouldn't even go in there and talk to them. He didn't want to hear that unbelief and family squabbling. And he'd go along somewhere and say, uh, Master, right in the middle of a sermon. Master, come make my brother share my inheritance. He said, who appointed me your, 
you judge over you. In other words, would you, would you quit right in the middle of the meeting here? If they'd had tongue talkers back there, then there'd be somebody stand up and start yelling in tongues right in the middle of his message. <laughs> I've had it happen. <clears throat> I was in one city where that happened right at the end. I was, I'm telling you, we were just right at the end of it. And I was just about to close it off on the power of the righteousness of God. And this woman just started speaking in tongues. I said, lady, hold that, please. She just got louder. Lady, please. I said, lady, shut up. (laughs) She just got louder. Finally, she quit. And the man sitting there said, Brother Copeland, she can't hear a word you say. She's deaf. I found out later he did this to people and told her she had a special gift and he had let her know when to talk. Well, I didn't know what to do. Rather than answer, I just dropped my head and went inside. And the Lord said, call her up there and lay your hands on her and I'll open her ears. (laughs) So I said, bring her up here. Well, he could hardly back out. (laughs) He brought her up and at that point, Oh, I am the bad guy in that meeting. I mean, everybody in there just tell that woman to shut up and come to find out she's deaf. (laughs) And she had such a bright look on her face. She thought everything is so fine. And she came up there smiling. And I just very tenderly did that and put my hands on her ears and put my fingers in her ears and just held it there for a moment and took my ears and said, oh! <laughs> now the other guy's the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it took the laying on of hands to do it. Praise God. So now, Acts chapter 5. Praise you, Jesus. I love this part. Let's go to uh, this is that situation to Ananias and Sapphira. Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yea, for so much. Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold the feet of them which have buried our husband are at the door and they'll bear it, take you out. She fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and, and found her dead and carried her forth and buried her by her husband. Whew. Great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. That was prayed over here in the fourth chapter. And it happened here then in the fifth. They laid hands, uh, the hands of the apostles Many signs and wonders. What's a wonder? Well, it makes you wonder. (laughs) And you say, oh, I just wonder. I wonder why I haven't had the manifestation yet. You're in wonderment and you better get in faith. You just keep wondering and the devil will answer you. Well, you're just not worthy right now. You need to do some soul searching and die to yourself. Really? You need to go to the Lord and say, 
in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, Father, according to John 16, 23, that whatsoever I ask the Father in his name, you would give it me, ask and receive that your joy may be made full. So I'm asking you, I believe for my manifestation. So would you give me instructions, please? Am I in the way? How am I missing it? The difference is in the attitude. So anyway, praise God. Acts 19, 6. Mm, mm, mm. I'm like Brother Hagin. Uh, Luke titled this, The Acts of the Apostles. Actually, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost. Praise you. It came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we've not so much as heard where there be any Holy Ghost. And he said, unto what were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. So this was a group of Baptists that were there in... Uh, Ephesus. <laughs> then said Paul, <laughs> John Verdi, baptized with the baptisms of repentance. All right. <clears throat> There's another baptism, but that's not in the church. That was John baptizing and calling for repentance. Through the blood of Jesus, our sins have been reconciled. So we're baptized in water to represent what he was preaching over there. And he's the one that baptized Jesus. Oh, glory to God. So, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Isn't that good? That just makes me want to camp and just preach on that whole deal. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, <clears throat> Acts 28, 8. You're going to like this. This is where this they got into a hurricane. It was a name storm. And uh, <clears throat> this is, he came in there. <laughs> Look back here in that 27th chapter. When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you would have hearkened to me. You should have hearkened to me. You should have listened to me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. He said, cheer up. Be of good cheer for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me, Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. 14, I mean, I mean, two weeks of this. Two weeks of being out there in that storm. He, I mean, they're throwing up and he says, cheer up. <laughs> <laughs> the plan was greater than the storm. He's going to Jerusalem or Rome. He's going to Rome. The aunt, God told him and the angel told him. So <clears throat> they were escaped. They knew that the island was called Melita. The barbarous people showed up no, us no little kindness. And, in, you know, they kindled a fire and received everyone because of the present rain, because of the cold. When Paul had gathered bundles of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out of the heat and fastened on his hand. The barbarians saw it. 
the venomous beast hang on his hand. And they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffered him not to live. He just shook the thing off in the fire and felt no harm. Albeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen dead. But then they looked a great while and saw no harm came to him. They changed their minds, thought he's a God. <laughs> well, that's even worse. In the same quarters were <clears throat> possessions or estates of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux or dysentery to whom Paul entered in and prayed. He prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Glory to God. <coughs> he prayed. He laid his hands on him. It doesn't say what he prayed. He laid his hands on him and healed him. Well, what do we say to that? Amen. What did Jesus say? It's the Father that dwells within me. He does the works. Yes. We've been a, a bit too timid in that area. Cornelius said, my servant, he said, I'll come heal him. All the time he's saying, it's the Father that dwells within me. He's the one who does the work and he's the good one. I'm not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's been times that, that the Lord has directed me to say, I'll come and Jesus will heal him. Yes. I don't know that that's not what Paul prayed when he prayed. I suspect he did. Because he gave Jesus a credit for everything but the storm. He laid his hands on him. And many things happened. A great move of God began. And you can track that move of God on Malta until today. And there, there, are, there, are, there are great uh, historical things about that very meeting and that very healing and that very healing happened by the laying on of hands. No wonder the laying on of hands, the doctrine of baptisms, the fundamental doctrine of Christ is laying on of hands right in the middle of the entire situation. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it wonderful? There's been times that uh, a number of times that I've been willing, but the, the Lord would say, no, you minister with the word of knowledge. Most of the time. But that's, that's pretty well come full circle. And, uh, and now I'm instructed of the Lord to begin to do again, to do much more of this. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 